of K. Can you see the screen? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in in regular, yeah. Is, is it a full screen mode? Okay. Anyway. Okay. So so uh, apologies for the, for the technical mishap. Uh, my name is Jong Pil Han. I'm currently an associate professor of uh, information systems and analytics at the U.S. School of Computing. I also wear some other hats. So I'm the deputy director for AI governance at AI Singapore. Also the deputy director at Trail at, at the Faculty of Law. Um, <clears throat> so um, just a so the title of the talk is Making the Crowd Wiser, Recombination Through Teaming and Crowdsourcing. So I'm going to talk about crowdsourcing. But before we talk about crowdsourcing, just a preamble, because I'm from the Department of Information Systems and Analytics. I just wanted to give you a background. Uh, you, you know, you've heard um, the previous talk was on like food science. Um, I think um, just looking at the program, all of the talks uh, that are coming afterwards and even the talk before in the morning uh, were really uh, from the, the pure more, more science perspectives, whereas uh, the School of Computing is kind of you know, we, we, we have computer science, but it's it's hard to say whether computer science is really a science in a, in a conventional, traditional uh, sense of the word. Information systems also is a very applied discipline. And so it's, I think it uh, it's useful to provide some background on what information systems is and, and information system research really entails. So information systems is basically, it's fundamentally a discipline that shapes the thinking and practice of IT strategy, IT management, and creating solutions in domains critical to the well-being of individuals, organizations, and societies. I mean, it's a very broad field. Um, uh, the School of Computing has two departments, computer science and, and uh, information systems and analytics, uh, whereas computer science focuses mainly on developing solutions to, well, you know, to problems uh, that can be you know, algorithmically, um, uh, you know, the solutions that are algorithmic. Uh, Information systems rather focuses on the deployment of information technology solutions and its impact on um, on, on individuals, uh, organizations, groups, work groups, societies as, as at the high level, even at the macro level. Uh, and so we need to understand, you know, how how to design systems and also how what the impacts will be, so that we can introduce um, you know, systems that are designed for good. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> One of the, the, the critical issues here is really um, not coming up with solutions to a well-defined problem, but really information systems focuses a lot on asking the right questions. What kind of systems should we develop and what are some of the properties of such systems? And so um, my research, I focus a lot on open innovation. So, you know, um, it's really creating solutions to worlds like big problems. So if you have complex problems, we need to come up with solutions. Uh, and if we let, you know, organizations, individuals, you know, to their own devices, they'll do their part, right? I'll come up with some solutions, you know, I'll, I'll innovate, I might create a startup, um, you know, and create products and services. Um, and, and that's been going on for, for, for forever. Uh, but we can actually leverage technology that um, to, to create a conducive platform such that these solution creation processes are actually maximized to create much better um, overall kind of solutions, uh, like a solution ecosystem for the world. And crowdsourcing is one of these uh, platforms. So um, crowdsourcing basically is a collection of information, opinions, or work from a group of people, of unknown people from the crowd, usually sourced uh, through the internet. And so it tries to leverage the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, you know, a prime example is the Netflix challenge. You're probably all aware. It's, you know, it's probably about 15 years ago. Uh, the Netflix challenge uh, ran between uh, October 2006 and went on through 2009. Uh, there were over 40,000 teams uh, from 186 different countries. So 186 different countries means almost every country in the world, every sovereign nation in the world that had entered the contest. And the prize was $1 million US dollars for the winner and um, and uh, over the years, uh, for each year, uh, fifty thousand dollars for the best progress during each year. So it was a sizable contest. The goal was the, the aim was to figure out how much somebody, a consumer, would enjoy a movie. Like what would they would rate inherently? Like what they would rate a movie, how they would rate a movie based on what they had bought, already watched. And this kind of is the basis for their recommendation algorithm. And um, Netflix at the time was using um, a, a recommendation engine uh, produced by um, Cinematch, a company called Cinematch. And the goal for winning the, the threshold for winning the $1 million was to beat Cinematch's recommendation by at least 10%. 
interestingly, by the end of the first week of the contest, so October 9, um, Cinematch's recommendation was already beaten, but not by 10%. So it was just beaten. It didn't reach the threshold of a million, but it took three years to reach 10% improvement. Okay. So this is, you know, this, this highlights the, the power of crowdsourcing. There are many other companies that are doing this. Lego is doing this. Pepsi Cola is doing this. Starbucks is doing this. Uh, if you think about uh, Starbucks has a Starbucks My Idea platform where consumers can suggest new ideas for different beverages. Uh, if you go to Starbucks, uh, and you, you do a takeaway, um, you know, a takeaway order, you 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 probably have experienced uh, this green plastic kind of stirrer thing that you plug into the hole of the, the lid. That was actually a solution, uh, an, an idea that came from um, Starbucks's uh, crowdsourcing platform. Unilever does it, Amazon does it. So it's pervasive. Okay, now why does crowdsourcing work so well? We kind of have to think of it in a, in a, in a more abstract theoretical way. And there was this award-winning paper, not mine, but an award-winning paper about 10 years ago from uh, Alan Afwa and Christopher Tucci called Crowdsourcing as a Solution to Distance Search. Basically, the idea here is that if we do internal R&D or have a designated contractor that does the research and development in a complex landscape, let's say, you know, the red dot here represents where, you know, um, the current understanding is and the blue dot is on this landscape um, where the height of, you know, a particular location indicates the quality of a particular solution. Um, you know, we want to go from the red to the blue. That's fundamentally the problem, innovation problem. Now, if you have an internal R&D, we have one red dot. You know, we have our R&D team. We may have two or three red dots, but we have, um, you know, very limited number of red dots that tries to reach the blue dot. We don't really know where the blue dot is. We only have an understanding of the local space. So I know if I pursue a solution, if I change some aspects of the, my solution in, in, in some ways, you know, I might be going up the, the fitness or the quality uh, ladder or quality um, measurements. Uh, but I don't know, I don't have a bird's eye view of the uh, overall landscape overall innovation landscape. So with internal R&D, I can basically get to the yellow. And from that yellow, I would be stuck at a local optima where you know um, I cannot, any, any additional changes to my current solution would actually move me down uh, the landscape. And wouldn't, yeah, so I'm stuck at a local optima. Whereas with crowdsourcing, now basically we're starting with a lot of red dots. You know, we have people with different knowledge backgrounds participating from all over the world, you know, 186 countries for the Netflix challenge. So there's 186, well, not 40,000 red dots on this complex landscape and they're independently searching. So when they independently search, the more red dots we have, the greater likelihood that we will have um, that there will be to reach the blue dot. That's basically the understanding of um, the, the reason, the mechanism for why crowdsourcing actually works very well. It's called the parallel path effect, right? So if we're able to engage as many contestants, so have a lot of red dots and engage as, as diverse as contestants, so have the red dots spread all over the landscape, then you know, by virtue of letting them search, uh, and that's what, what you know, uh, innovators do, is search through their problem landscape, do local search, uh, we will have at least one of these red dots reach the blue dot. Okay, so uh, if we think about it, a lot of prior research has actually tried to leverage this uh, understanding, this theoretical understanding about um, innovation as landscape search or crowdsourcing as, as distributed landscape search and focused on things like reward structure. How do we do, you know, do we do prize guarantees? Do we, you know, give you know, reward just to the best one or do we give multiple rewards to the best X, a best N, um, you know, do we, uh, or looking at the project characteristics, you know, how do we, to create a better problem specifications to uh, in, to induce more participants uh, to become contestants in these in these contests. Okay, so um, even contest structure, providing feedback on progress, you know, having transparency of other people's solutions along the way. All these encourage more people to participate and more diverse people to participate. Right. So this is the idea of crowdsourcing. Have many people. Engage as many people, like many like people, stick figures here, uh, to, to work on the problem. But there's a problem here. If we look at the innovation literature from, from business and economics, we know that innovation is basically recombination of knowledge. It's really copying ideas from a distant field and repackaging it in a, in a separate field, right? So it's really when you combine you know, different perspectives and knowledge from different backgrounds where true innovation actually happens. But this picture does not 
incorporate this recombination idea. Rather, this picture incorporates the idea of recombination, people working together, recombining knowledge with people with different backgrounds, working together to create innovative solutions. Okay, so um, basically, and that's what we observe um, actually in practice. If we look at, uh, so we have, uh, we collected some data from Kaggle and try to look at whether teams or individuals perform better. And this, this basically shows you the performance distribution in rank percentile. So rank zero would be best performance, rank 100 percentile would be worst performance across teams and individuals. And in the teams actually is more right skewed, meaning um, there's um, a higher, greater, higher likelihood that teams would be on the, on the very low ranks compared to individuals. So teams perform better, okay? So, you know, when we think about knowledge recombination in, in online crowdsourcing, we have to think about the crowdsourcing problem itself, so the complexity of the problem and the temporality. Um, you know, the contestants come into the platform, not as teams, but they work on the problems and at a later point, they might um, decide to team up and work with other, other, you know, concurrent, you know, other contestants and create a joint solution. Now, what that does is it reduces, fundamentally reduces, teaming up fundamentally reduces the parallel path effect, right? So if you had, uh, you know, let's say a thousand contestants and, you know, we had teams of two. So that reduces a thousand possible solutions to 500 because everybody, every, every team is a team of two, right? And so um, it we, although you're reducing the parallel path effect, you're creating um, you know, an inducive, conducive environment where we can leverage the recombination effect. Now, temporality becomes important because the teams can be formed early in the, in the contest or very late, right? So early means we haven't had much time to search. And so, um, you know, we, we don't really know where, we're not stuck yet. We're not, we don't have a good um, local solution yet. And, and because we don't know each other, the contestants don't know each other, there's a lot of uncertainty about who to team up with. Ideally, anybody would want to team up with somebody with a better solution that maximizes my likelihood of winning the reward, right, the, the reward money. Um, but uh, at the same time, that means people or well, contestants would want to team up as late as possible. But if you team up as late as possible, what happens is that you don't have much time to actually learn from each other and co-develop the solution. So there's an inherent trade-off, and we wanted to study that kind of trade-off. Okay, so because of the lack of familiarity with other contestants, this kind of problem arises. Okay, so we're going to look at who, when, how, so what in in this in this domain. Uh, what we do, and again, uh, um, I asked research. There's many different ways of doing this. I tend to I, I choose or I employ a method called um, uh, computational social science. So I develop computational models, meaning uh, you know models that are um, just uh, you know, computer code or programs that actually try to simulate individual human behavior that's based on our theoretical understanding about you know, cognition. Uh, and then we run the simulation in many different kind of you know parameter space. Uh, you know throughout you know, we explore the parameter space to derive um, to to create simulated data and we try to derive theoretical insights and theoretical propositions from the data that we, we, um, we simulate. Okay, so fundamentally, if we have a good model, like theory-based model, we can actually simulate it to see what would happen, right? And analyze the data to, to you know, to, to show patterns, to show, to create, you know, to, to compare across different you know, um, manipulations, different experimental conditions, and that allows us to create, um, derive insights and propositions, okay? So we, we, we're gonna create a simulation model of crowdsourcing. We're gonna use uh, something called the NK fitness landscapes model. And this, this instantiates the idea of complex landscape search. Um, and this, this came out of uh, theoretical biology from the Santa Fe Institute. Basically, it's kind of mimicking uh, the idea of gene mutation. Okay, and, and the survival of the fittest. So, you know, organisms mutate their genes to increase their fitness levels for a particular environment. Uh, and, and that's, there's a search for the optimal gene. Okay, in any case, the NK model basically uh, is uh, simply, um, the, the formalism basically has, um, you know, any solution, any, any kind of organism or a crowdsourcing solution or an organization information system can be characterized as a system of interdependent choices. And there are end decisions about how to configure a system, how to configure a 
solution, at least in this crowdsourcing space. Each decision contributes to the overall fitness of the problem, of the overall system, and the fitness contribution of each decision uh, depends on k other decisions. So n and k are the two parameters of the model. N is basically the number of decisions to configure, and K is the, the level of interdependencies among these N elements. And discovery is done via local search. So there's experiential search. I'm, I'm gonna, I can't just find, you know, try to um, come up with a, a completely different random solution. I have to tweak my solution and try to find um, uh, a better, uh, higher um, fitness uh, configuration. Okay, so that's, that's the fun, basic idea. Uh, the, the, the powerful thing about this NK model is that it allows the modeler, the researcher like myself, to create um, different environments, right? So if we, the parameter K basically sets the complexity of the problem. So if you have a small K, then you know, what that means is each decision is independent, right? And so the complexity is very low. And so you end up with a very smooth landscape. Whereas if you increase K, the more you increase K, you, you end up with the Alps kind of representation. So there's a lot of peaks, a lot of local peaks, which means that it's that much more harder to find through local search, the global optimum. Okay. Now, um, you know, the, the search process is basically um, uh, local search, meaning, you know, if, if a particular configuration D uh, can be represented as an n bit string, um, you know, basically, I'm going to change, you know, one of these values um, from a zero to a one, again, the binary, um, Kind of representation is just a simplification. We don't have to do it in a, in a binary way. It's just simpler that way. Uh, and then you know you end up until you kind of get stuck here in a simple landscape. Obviously, you'll end up at the optimal solution because there's no local peaks. In a rugged landscape, same thing. We we change locally, change you know one of these configurations, and I end up where all of my neighbors are uh, performing lower. Right? So I, can, I cannot get higher, and that's a local peak, and I get stuck there. Okay? So how do we incorporate these ideas of crowdsourcing into this basic um, uh, NK model? So first, we take the problem space as the same, um, and we take um, agents, uh, each of the participants in the crowdsourcing contest, as you know, agents with limited knowledge. I know some things, but I don't know everything. Now, these crowdsourcing problems are complex. I may be an, an expert in, in, let's say, um, like machine learning, but I don't know anything about biology or food science, right? Somebody else might come in and say, oh, I know a lot about food science, but I don't know anything about philosophy, right? So everybody has a distinct set of knowledge. Um, so each agent holds some knowledge and it's limited, okay? And the knowledge set, the team's knowledge set would be the combination of, you know, the participants' knowledge sets. Okay, I'm going to try to go quicker because there's a lot of formalism here. Now, in the search, um, there's, so there's um, uh, during the contest, there's a team up probability. So at any point in time, we can initiate team up, and the team up could be accepted with some probability based on some preference. Okay, and the team adopts a new solution, a new proposal, if the new proposal is perceived to be of higher fitness than the current status quo. Okay, so. Um, Basically, if we have two, two individuals, U and V, where U um, has knowledge, you know, index one, two, set four, and seven, and, and V has knowledge index three, four, seven, and eight. Uh, basically, over time, U and V learn from each other and get to know about the, the knowledge domains that they didn't know before, but the other um, um, other par partner has, right? So uh, in the beginning at time T zero, um, U uh, did not know three, but over time, you get to know a bit about three, and over time, more time passes, and now you can be uh, said to be know a lot about C, about three, although you cannot change um, three. Okay, it doesn't have the control over three. Okay, so in this case, uh, in a separate case, you can have complete known overlap where you know U has one, two, four, seven, uh, or V, oh, sorry, typo there, V has three, six, eight, nine. There's no overlap. So over time, there's no mutual learning. Right, so uh, it's important to know who you partner with it, um, has implications uh, based on um, the limited knowledge and the knowledge overlap. Okay, so again, uh, the two examples you would have, you know, the the overall team's um, kind of knowledge uh, scope uh, would, uh, and the overlap would be in a in a trade-off relationship. You can increase the overall scope, but you would have. Uh, fewer overlap, 
Okay. Anyway, so uh, we ran a bunch of experiments, computational experiments. So we have, you know, we have a simulation model running, and we can, you know, um, like run all these experiments. Um, so, you know, we 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 ran experiments to test the advantages of teaming up, so comparing individuals versus teams, even randomly formed teams, not strategically formed teams, but randomly formed teams. We also looked at what is the best optimal uh, choice of teammate. How should we choose the best teammate, even if it's kind of random? Um, and how does the, the you know, problem complexity and the timing of teams actually influence the outcomes? Uh, we've compared the different ways of forming teams. So they could be rank-based, where you know, I try to team up with somebody with similar or higher rank. Or diversity-based is where I try to um, uh, team up with somebody who has knowledge that I don't have, right? So to maximize diversity or minimize it. Um, and then random formation. And then we also looked at platform level outcomes, right? Because uh, it could be because the teaming up reduces the parallel path effect. You know, we have less solution submissions. You know, does the extra um, benefit from recombination actually compensate for that reduction in parallel path effect? So, are we getting overall better solutions, better, fewer, better solutions than a lot of not so good solutions? Right, so that's that's a comparison. Anyway, first experiment, team versus individuals. Run the experiment at different levels of complexity. We do see that you now as you increase um, the number of contestants, naturally the, um, the, the rate of reaching the optimal solution, which is kind of the, a way to measure the, the, uh, the performance of the teams and individuals actually goes up over, over a greater number of contestants. And uh, even with very high complex uh, problems, we see that teams perform better than individuals. So teams better than individuals. Let's look at knowledge overlap. Across different levels of complexity, these are the columns, and across different timings of teams. So early timing is at the beginning of the contest. Middle timing is like during the middle of the contest, and late timing will be near the very end of the contest. What we see are like it depends. It depends on problem complexity, and it also depends on uh, the timing, right? So if you look at low complexity, we see that um, low overlap is actually good, right? So we, because they're independent, we don't need to coordinate. So having low overlap uh, and, and timing doesn't really matter, right? Um, with medium complexity, there's now there's a bit more interdependencies between the decisions. And here uh, it, it's inverted u shape, uh, especially for early and middle timing, right? So what this means is having common ground and mutual understanding, some Kind of ways so that we can do mutual learning is very important. So low diversity or low overlap or high overlap is worse than having moderate overlap. Okay, so sacrificing in the overall scope, team scope is better um, than um, uh, is is worth um, having more overlap and opportunities for mutual learning. With extreme high complexity, uh, it's actually best if you have late timing to have complete overlap, meaning two people. Uh, working on this, knowing the same problem. So an economist working with an economist submitting a solution is much better, um, but this is with late timing, okay? So it, it, it really depends on complexity and team formation time, which means the time for mutual learning, okay? Now, experiment three, we looked at uh, team formation approaches. Um, basically, we have, you know, random rank and diversity-based and a hybrid of rank and diversity-based. What we see again is that, um, Across levels of complexity, we see that, uh, what do we see? Hybrid, uh, if we compare rank and diversity, um, rank actually performs better um, than diversity in uh, low complexity, but diversity, uh, where is this? Uh, rank is a very good signal for late formation, right? So timing, rank is always higher. Uh, because there's no time to learn from each other, so might as well go with the best teammate, okay? With early formation, we see that diversity and hybrid are actually better. And overall, we see an inverted U-shape. So timing, optimal timing would be uh, around the middle, okay? And since you're doing around the middle, if you're doing late, rank-based is better. If you're doing around the middle, then hybrid or diversity-based actually produces better outcomes, okay? So we see an inverted U-shape across timing. Early is not good because we have very bad signals. We have imperfect signals uh, because we haven't had time to actually work on the problems. We don't, we don't know if 
the counterparty is good or bad. Late is bad because we don't have time for mutual learning. So middle is, is best, okay? Now, finally, to look at platform level outcomes, uh, when we compare the actual performance of individuals, what we see here is that rank base, the second column in each of these graphs is actually the highest. So what this means is for individuals doing rank based teaming, so finding somebody with the higher rank or the highest rank possible actually increases, maximizes my likelihood of winning the contest, okay? But if you look at the platform level, and this is, uh, the, um, we're looking at overall coverage, not, um, like solution coverage. So uh, given that we have you know, 4,096 possible solutions, we are counting, where this is like a frequency distribution of the number of times each um, teaming approach uh, produce kind of you know the that rank right. So if we have higher on the left hand side near the the zeros, that means that's a better overall. We have better coverage of good solutions. Now if we look closely here at one um, one uh, situation, one one parameter setting, which is the late timing and um, high complexity. Okay, what we see here is actually that rank-based formation is actually very bad, right? So at the very left, on the zero side, we see a significant drop in the coverage rate. Now, what that means is there's a, there's a inherent misalignment between contestant and platform level objectives. Contestants want to win a prize, and so they will go with rank-based, because that's one that maximizes the likelihood of getting the reward. But if you go with rank-based, then the solution, somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna get the reward, but the solutions the platform collects will be of lower quality. Overall, the distribution of the solutions will be of lower quality, okay? So that's this is some misalignment, okay? So I'm going to just um, kind of end it here with some like overall, right? Um, summary and, and implications for, for this field. Um, here, we're reintroducing this recombination perspective of innovation into crowdsourcing research, which has been absent. So we're bridging these two, two, two literatures. Uh, we're highlighting the trade-off between diversity and overlap in, in knowledge recombination. And uh, we're highlighting this, this um, misalignment between stakeholders, the platform, and the contestants' interest in, in, this, um, in this context. So it provides us with much better understanding of how should we design crowdsourcing platforms? Do we highlight rank? Do we highlight, um, you know, the contestants' knowledge backgrounds, right? So that, you know, or do we create recommendation systems for, you know, teaming up for party, you know, counterparties um, that, that maximizes diversity or maximizes overlap, so on and so forth. Again, uh, as, as um, uh, Professor Limson, Wong Limson mentioned earlier, um, I'm not, not bragging or anything, but this paper was with a student of mine, a PhD, current PhD student. Uh, and uh, actually last year uh, won the best paper award at the International Conference on Information Systems. So this is kind of a summary of that paper. There's also kind of an empirical component, but given the lack of time, I'm going to skip that. Okay. Um, if there are some questions, I would be happy to take questions. There is a question. Yeah, I, 